Hello there, my fellow space chevaliers, and welcome back to some Warhammer 40k lore. After a few requests from my subscribers, I decided to return to a playlist, which I think it has been more than a year since I last revisited. These are the mighty and honorable Imperial Knights. If you check the other videos in the list, you are also going to find a lot of Imperial Knight content already including episodes on houses, night designs, and much more. But there is an aspect of this topic which I didn't cover much the first time around, and that was the minor night houses. So today I shall be telling the tale of House Vironi, a story from even before the Great Crusade began. Complete honesty here, I have no idea how their name is actually pronounced, so if anyone out there does know, do correct me. I would hate to make a second video and still mispronounce them. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? To summarize, House Vironi, known also as the Wardens of Fellweather or the God Eaters, is a secundus grade Imperial Night House of the Questor Imperialis. Hailing from the Night World of Demetus Free, House Vironi was allied to the Imperium in the bitter war against the traitors of Horus. One of the most ancient night houses in the Segmentum Obscurus, the Vironi shed so much of their noble blood during the Age of Strife that their numbers and resources were dangerously depleted by the closing of the Great Crusade. Determined not to become a mute spectator to their own destiny, the nobles of House Vironi swore that they would stand firm against the arch traitor or perish in the attempt. The nobility of this house are known for their uniquely sorrowful disposition, a manner born of the knowledge that their ancestors' five millennia vigil against the terrors of old night might have been rendered useless or obliterated at the hands of a warrior who was once the Emperor's favorite son. It is a demeanor bred into the bloodline by the lonely moon orbiting a bloated green gas giant that the Vironi call home. The Metus Free was found in a star system at the junction of several minor but stable warp routes, a world of deep twisted forests and mist-shrouded swamps, above which the towers of the imposing Fellweather Keep rise. This is a vast fortress edifice erected out of the corpse of their founding colony arc when the planet was settled back in the Age of Technology. When first discovered, the Metus Free was found to harbor a vast array of autochthonic lifeforms. Its dark forests were populated by cephalopod and mammalian hybrids, many of gigantic size, lurking in the trackless swamps or nesting in the hollow boughs of colossal yet rotting trees. Might as well call this planet H.P. Lovecraft's dreamland. And those malign creatures were capable of communication too, and would demand obeisance out of their human newcomers. The Night Colony was of a different power and temper though, and a war ensued, with the human settlers drawing on their STC systems at the heart of the Fellweather Keep to battle the monsters that would feast upon them. When fighting was joined, the swamp seas boiled and the vine-wrapped forest burned black as the two sides fought, emerald skies turning to a night that lingered for decades until, at length, the god wings were cast down or driven into the most remote depths of the trackless wastes. Thus did the Knights of Vironi become literal god slayers. By then though, unfortunately, humanity's golden age was at an end, and an era of damnation was upon the galaxy instead. Throughout the long darkness of old night, the Knights of Demetus stood firm against countless invasions many by alien races not encountered since and which must stay unnamed, others by infamous familiar enemies like the Dark Eldar or the brutal Orc Marauders. One strain of Xenos in particular turned its gaze upon the Damita system with deadly consequence, and these were the Mitu Conglomerate. For many centuries the Knights of Damita stood resolute against the hated Mitu. Although they cared not for conventional invasion and such, their periodic attentions brought unspeakable devastation, and when a fresh wave of alien horrors descended out of the emerald skies, the noble keeps built across the surface of Demeter's Free were reduced to ruin, and even the mighty Fellwater Keep itself was damaged considerably. Still, the Vironi stood at the edge of a precipice. 
Resigned to their inevitable doom, they renewed all their woes, and took their places to await the attack that they thought would finish them. But the doom of the Vironi never came. There was nothing but silence in the heavens, until, finally, a new star appeared in the firmament. An unfamiliar contrail speared downwards to the surface of Demeter's Free, and the craft would set down in the forest, having blasted the landing zone clear of the dense vegetation. The knights of House Vironi strode out to meet whatever this was, suspicious but ready to sell their lives dearly should the end be revealed. It was, however, not to be that way, for the spaceship was a stormbird of the First Legion, the Dark Angels, representing the outrider of a great crusade fleet in the region. You see, the Legion itself was now piercing deeper into the surrounding void, having eradicated the Xenos of the Mitu conglomerate. Had Providence afforded them this luxury, the masters of the Vironi might have considered themselves betrayed by fate, denied both the glory of a final stand and a vindication of victory against an ancient foe. Instead of all that, the Vironi were carried up in fire and fury in the Great Crusade bound to a debt of liberation they believed they could never repay. They would take their place among the great host of humanity, adhering to the established chain of command, albeit never fully committing themselves to the ambition and intrigue that came with them, and always maintaining a respectful and honorable distance bored of years of isolation. They would serve along the dark angels which had found them, later with the word bearers and the Imperial Fists, as well as a dozen other fleets of the Exertus Imperialis. They gained honor and the respect of their peers, but also a reputation for melancholy and withdrawn reserve. So it was that the crusading scions ordered their sacristans to apply emerald green heraldry to their armor in memory of their home, a livery that was soon established as theirs alone by the Officio Militaris College of Arms as the Great Crusade ground onward. A period of assimilation and rebuilding began while the bulk of the House Army was fighting among the stars, during which delegation after delegation came before Grandmaster Yak of the Vironi and his court. The visitor's shock at the decrepit state of holdings was impossible to conceal, as the envoys came from the nearby planets of the Mechanicum, including Mazoa and the recently established Cyclophrave Holdfast as well as more illustrious forge worlds such as Lucius. All desired that the house swear themselves to them as feudal subjects, and in return offered to replace the ancient and often repaired knight armors with brand new machines of newer design. These possible benefactors desired more than service though, for they coveted the ancient crystal data stacks buried beneath Fellweather Key. Scornful of the undisguised avarice of some, and the strange dogma of the others, Yak sent them all away, on the pretext of considering all their options. Serving across five different expedition fleets in the closing decades of the Great Crusade, the Knights of House Vironi fought with distinction continuously, including in the costly Orphrus extermination, the Cusarico Nebula suppression, and the Calistaria compliance campaign. Word of each victory would bolster Yak's position regarding the pacts he must eventually enter into with one of the greater Mechanicum organizations, whose emissaries were still pressing for an audience even though years had passed since the last one. The wars fought out among the stars, however, garnered not only honor, but an ever more pressing need to replace their armors lost in battle. The point of this decision eventually arrived and Yak determined that in order to survive, the house had to finally align itself with the Forge world. Expediency determined that that choice was Cyclofrey, whose offers of material aid had been the greatest thus far out of all those received. Little did the nobles of Vironi know that the hour they had picked for such an alliance was an ill-chosen one, for it was the year 005 M31. Unknown to them, events were unfolding at Istvan III that would prove catastrophic for the Imperium. The act of the bonding between the Night World and Forge World was to take place on Demeter's III, before the crumbling and vine-swaved Fellweather Keep itself. All the scions assigned to the Great Crusade that could be recalled were recalled, mustering in the landing zone first blasted by the First Legion Stormbird many years ago almost the entirety of the Great House awaited the coming of one of the High Magi of Cyclophrave. 
About an hour before the appointed time, a lander plummeted out of the skies belching flames and smoke from a blasted thruster. It bore the crown skull emblem of the Vironi, and before the engines had even cycled down, the access ramp lowered and out of it came a limping figure. This was none other than Gios, the eldest son of the Grandmaster Yak. Gios limped across the landing zone and fell to his knees before his father's Serastus Lancer, with only one word on his lips, and that word was betrayal. Thus was the House Vironi plunged into the fires of Horus's rebellion against the Emperor. The delegation out of Cyclothrafe was not an emissary bearing gifts, but a strike force, loyal not to the Imperium, but the War Master. And if not for the desperate bravery of Gios himself, its surprise attack might have overwhelmed the entire house. Instead, the Vironi were roused to war. The battle that followed was brief, but among the most destructive and desperate ever fought by the Knights of the House. It saw the death of the old Grandmaster at the hands of a murderous Cyclophrafian Knight Octolor. At the end, the forces of the Tagmata were driven away, but at a terrible cost with nearly a quarter of the entire fighting force of House Vironi destroyed or broken. In the aftermath of his father's death, it would fall to the wounded Gios to lead the house, an oath he swore in addition to one to exact bitter vengeance against the killer of his father. But alone, unfortunately, the Vironi had no chance to strike back against the sovereign forge world. When news of the attack reached Imperial authorities, it was met with spurious counterclaims forestalling action, while the rising tide of fear and war drowned out all the calls for justice out of House Vironi. Only on the loyal forge world of Mezoa did they find the outrage echoed and answered, and where an alliance with Cyclothrafe had been betrayed, a similar pact with Mezoa was hastily agreed upon. Nevertheless, the Vironi would not give up their independence in a formal feudal submission, even when faced with the very threat of extinction. When the war came in earnest to the Cyclops cluster, for the Vironi, the lines had already been drawn long before. To the Emperor they owed a debt they could not repay. To the War Master they owed nothing. That the hated Magi of Cyclophrafe would so soon openly declare for the War Master only confirmed to the Vironi that their cause was just. Thus, the Knights of the House would stand bloodied but resolute among the ranks of the Loyalists forevermore. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Nighthouse Vironi and their troubled history for today. I do believe I will also return with another video on them, with stuff like organization, famous pilots and machines, and maybe more. I know for sure that at least one person requested this topic in the past, so I hope they enjoyed this narration. What about the rest of you though? Were you aware of this smaller but no less worthy Nighthouse? Are they among your favorite Imperial Knight factions? As always, I welcome any of your thoughts in the comments below. If you found the episode informative or entertaining, please consider leaving a like, share and subscribe for future content. Thanks a lot for watching and the Emperor protects.